Welcome to the HR Chat Podcast, bringing the best of the HR and talent communities to you. Welcome to another episode of the HR Chat Podcast, brought to you by the HR Gazette. I'm your host, Bill Bannum, and today we are joined by Chris Bailey. Chris is Director of People and Organization at PwC. He's the president of the Cayman Island Society for Human Resource Professionals, an organizer of the first Disrupt HR Cayman event, and a whole lot more. Chris, welcome to the HR Chat podcast. Oh, you made me sound important. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, it's great. It's great that you could, you could join us. Now, at, at the beginning of, of, of these shows, we, we like to start by learning a bit more about who you are and what your background is. So to begin with, t- tell us about your recent career uh, up, up to joining PwC. So I've pretty much spent the last 15 years uh, in and around talent acquisition, HR consulting and um, recruitment um, in three, uh, yeah, three, nearly four different countries. So I started out in the UK, worked in London, um, managed to um, joined a couple of very successful um, teleacquisition consultancies. Um, we floated one in 2007, and at that point I decided that um, looking at something away from our fair shores in the UK was going to be um, more fun and uh, less, uh, less rain and wind, and so therefore I found a job in Bermuda. Um, and that's really where I think my, um, I suppose, knowledge of HR consulting started to blossom because I was thrown in at the deep end, um, having to learn a market I knew very little about, which was the reinsurance market in Bermuda, um, and help devise uh, HR strategies for a lot of reinsurance startup companies um, and provide resources for those companies to manage that through. So I had four wonderful years in uh, in Bermuda doing doing just that. Um, for some reason, we decided that going back to London was a really good idea and that we'd forgotten all about the long commutes and the rain, the wizard of weather, and um, oh, paying tax, that was something we'd forgotten all about. <laughs> so we arrived back in uh, back in London and um, actually joined a great company there and, uh, you know, it was all it was all good, but we realized that the uh, being, a, being a, an expat and working in the offshore territories was something that was... Uh, going to stay with us for some time to come and I, and I think it was actually my wife's 39th birthday and she turned around to me in a in a pub in strapped upon avon and just sort of said why aren't we in the cayman islands <laughs> and, uh, I, I realized at that point that we were heading for another move uh, overseas and um fortunately, fortunately enough we were uh, offered a position out here in grand cayman to work with uh, another um consultancy that did uh, a bit of everything initially and that was uh, CML and CML are a great recruitment uh, company also doing HR uh, consulting payroll all, all sort of things associated with, with human capital and um, there were a lot sort of more boutique in, uh, in enterprise and opportunity so I was brought in to, to run um, that business and did so for the last five years um, gave me a great insight into the offshore market and financial services and obviously the Cayman Islands so now when I tell people I sort of live and work in the Cayman Islands, I lose a lot of friends very quickly. Um, as it's a very, very nice place <laughs> to be. So um, as part of that journey over the last five years, um, one of the things I believe in intrinsically is you, you get out what you put in. When you join a small island or small company or um, any company for that matter, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. So. I threw myself into getting to know the HR community in the region, um, what it had to offer, and you know, could I lend my expertise to helping grow it, support it, uh, in whatever way, shape, or form that may take. So that led me to joining the HR Society in the Cayman Islands. Um, I think 12 months after joining it, I put myself forward for um, uh, to be nominated for the board, uh, was successfully uh, appointed to the board of the society, and then... Uh, I think that was a, uh, I don't know if it was a smart move by me, but the first uh, ask they had of me was to, to um, put on a, uh, a large Caribbean-specific HR conference. So, you know, fortunately, that led me to um, getting to know the likes of your good self and several other speakers in, uh, in the U.S. 
that I brought down for the conference simply because I wanted people and the HR professionals in the Cayman Islands to have access to uh, international speakers, thought leaders in the in the area of HR, which until kind of in the last few years, I think you know, Cayman had really been overlooked because we weren't putting anything on that was attracting them down here to come and tell us you know, what, what is the latest and greatest news in, in, in HR. And instead, we were all leaving the island, going to the Sherm Conference or other, other events in and around the US uh, and trying to bring that knowledge back here. And what I wanted to do is bring the knowledge to Cayman. Um, so this year is, I think, the fourth, maybe fifth conference that I'll have put on. And we've seen numbers grow from sort of 150 people attending to nearly 300 with a marketplace and exhibitors and to the Ritz-Carlton. So it kind of has a certain level of prestige. And we've had people from all over the world now sign up as uh, uh, people who want to come to this conference and I wonder why come and stay at the Ritz Carlton Cayman Islands and <laughs> see a HR conference it sort of has a ring to it and that um, <laughs> that conference led me to being introduced to um, a lady called Jennifer McClure who is uh, a big deal in the in the HR sort of speaker world um, and she came down and spoke here and I had her back a second I do believe a third year she was popular demand um, and Jen actually called me about something that she was uh, spearheading, which was the Disrupt HR event. And she just said, Chris, you know, I really, really think that Cayman's ready for a Disrupt event. Would you be interested in uh, in hosting it? And I think I gave it a, all of about three seconds of thought and just said, yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's put our Disrupt event on in Cayman. And our first event was, um, um, was it earlier on this year? Or, yeah, I think it was... Uh, Yes, it was in May this year. <laughs> this year's flown by. I can't believe we're in December. Um, and we had, oh crikey, six or seven international speakers propped with, um, I think, six or seven local speakers here. And what was beautiful about it was everybody gave gave it their gave it their all, and you couldn't really tell uh, the professional international speakers apart from our local speakers. They all had great stories. They all had good messages. It was a really fun evening. Plenty of um, wine and dong and. Um, you know, it's being uh, hotly uh, contested to be a speaker at it for uh, the 2017 event, so which will be announced shortly, maybe on one of your next shows. Okay, there you go, listeners. Look forward to that. Um, I, I can attest to how amazing it was. I, I was lucky to be there covering it on behalf of the, the HR Gazette. Um, we're gonna Bill, we're gonna cycle Bill really back. Struggled in, uh, Bill really struggled in terms of not wanting to come. I mean, you know, it was a real it was a real tough ask to say, did you want to come to Cayman and cover this event? And I, I know that you were. It was with a heavy heart you said you'd come. So I'm glad you had a good time, Bill. Yeah, it was it was a you know a, a testing time for me. Big decision. Um, should I should I uh, leave leave Toronto for a, a couple of days to go to? You know, essentially paradise. It's such a pool, but uh, fortunately, I man- managed to make it there. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're going to circle back on disrupt HR Cayman in a bit. But before before that, uh, let, let, let's talk a bit more about your role as director of people and organisation at PwC. So you've been there now for a little while, a few months. Now that you've had a bit of time to settle in, uh, what does your average week look like? Well, tell, tell us about your role and. Okay, so it's seven months into what is a fascinating service line for PwC. Um, globally, PwC have this service line called People and Organization. Um, historically, it was probably called Human Capital Consulting, but basically it's part of their advisory service line where we help PwC clients um, really get the best out of their, their people. I mean, we all know as we're in HR, that the, the human capital element of any business is probably the most important. So how do we maximize it? How do we make sure we're utilizing it correctly? So what, what, the, what the good metrics or data look like and how can you use that within your organization? And so many companies um, you know, really want a, an extra pair of buyers helping them with the HR strategy. Um, they may not know why they've got uh, high turnover, so sometimes it's just easy and credible to just ask somebody who knows what they're doing to help them identify uh, risks, pitfalls, strengths, positivities, anything that uh, can help them make the most of it. So globally we have this service line, but it's never ever been available in uh, the Cayman Islands or really the region uh, as a whole. We, we do it as, a, as project consulting that has been done over the years. Uh, 
with uh, in response to RFPs, but we've never established a core uh, team in the region that's solely dedicated to helping all of the uh, Caribbean countries with their people and organisation. So, yeah, my my goal is to identify the qualifications that we had in the region. Um, we've got some brilliant sector experts in Bermuda, Barbados, uh, Bahamas, Jamaica, and we're bringing them together to provide um, the Caribbean offering of people and organisation. So, for an example, you know, we've done some amazing work with um, uh, some of the government organisations in the region, and we're allowing other other organisations similarly to sort of leverage the knowledge base on that. And that's that's the beauty of the, the POC Global uh, offering is that we've worked with so many of the world's leading organisations um, that there's a knowledge base here that we want to bring to market. Um, and so that's why the, the need for the team. And I think it doesn't matter where you are in the world these days. If you're a company that is growing, if you're a company that really does believe in core values and its people, then you, you need to really understand what's driving your people, what's engaging them, um, and what um, what policies you can put in place um, to make sure that you get the best out of your human capital workforce. So being able to provide thought leadership in the region, coming from the region, offering sort of best practice advice that's of a global standard is something that, you know, hasn't been done before, and I'm, I'm really excited to kind of be leading the charge um, in, in our little slice of the world that, uh, that's, that's going to make a huge impact on companies here. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, tell me, uh, what what are the top tools, uh, on online tools, that a director of people and organisation uses dur during the average working week? So there's a number of different, I mean, it's there's so many different tools out there that it is a minefield of what's right to use, what's wrong to use. And honestly, I, the first thing I said to people that are thinking of doing something is only use a tool that's going to be effective for what the outcome is going to be because so many different tools do so many of the same things. And one of the things that companies forget is, okay, but what, what is the rationale for using a particular tool? And... One of the, some of the most successful stuff I, I've seen being done and implemented um, recently is using really good benchmarking data. Um, so uh, being able to say to yourself, okay, how are we benchmarking ourselves against our competition, uh, uh, similar size organizations, uh, and so on and so forth. And what I mean by that is actually looking at what metrics you're going you're gonna to benchmark against and then using a relevant tool that gives you very good specific benchmarking data. Now, PwC has one. It's called Saratoga, and there are a number, I mean, thousands and thousands of companies globally in various different sectors are already providing data and have been providing data for nearly 20 years into the Saratoga benchmarking tool. And therefore, when a company, let's say they are in aviation, says, look, how do we compare against other aviation companies in you know, in the world, in, in Florida, in, in you know, in Miami, up in the East Coast, because and, and what sort of turnover are they seeing, and where they're getting their people from, and you know, what's their average age of retirement, and all that sort of stuff. Then we can benchmark like for like businesses, so that you can get a really good idea as to where you're currently sat, and actually what's working in one company might be might work better for you in in your company. So. I find that a very, very powerful tool, but I think so many people get carried away with technology these days that they forget to just take a step back and, and just look at the simple data. Because a lot of the time, that, that simple, um, what I would call almost a HR audit um, over your current data, or your current workforce, can lead you to so much, so much more discovery than, than simply just implementing a tool because it, the tool says it can do everything. At the end of the day, the tool is only as good as the people using it, and a lot of the people using it don't really know why they're using it. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it's it's an interesting, I'm actually more old school. I mean, yes, there are some phenomenal IT tools to use, but only when the company's ready to actually do it. If you don't have your data right to use a tool, the tool is meaningless. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in, in the, the power of talking to your employees, talking to the relevant managers, getting quantified response to really good metric creation. Um, and, and utilising that in order to assess what your HRIS needs might be going forward. Um, and we, you can do that on a small, medium and obviously large scale. So I'm not going to plug any one particular tool right now. Um, 
simply because I think that so many companies need to take a step back and identify the why rather than the which one. Okay, thank you. I, I love that take on the uh, on the answer there. So, in in addition to your position at PwC, you're also the president of Society for Human Resource Professionals, and you're the chair of the annual conference. Uh, tell us about the society and, and what you do there. We have a um, we have a, a really cool um, group of about 300 members now of the HR Society, which has been steadily growing over the last crikey 10 years. Um, they all have an absolute thirst for knowledge, and trying to satisfy that thirst is um, is difficult when you're in the islands because you know we have something like the fifth largest financial centre in the world is based in the Cayman Islands. Um, yet, you know, a lot of the uh, the knowledge that needs to be transferred to our HR professionals down here just simply doesn't come. We get we get overlooked. So part of my remit is to make sure that we offer some of the best-in-class uh, CPD training. We, we bring great people down for conference. Um, we communicate effectively with our members. You know, the website is completely overhauled and, uh, and useful for people that want to use it. So I think the, the role of the president is really to make sure that you know, we are, uh, are certainly on a par with, uh, with the other global um, HR societies around the world. And, and, and we talk as such. I mean, I think we actually send one of the largest contingents to the Sherm Com um, per capita or per head uh, than any other country. I think we have some like 20 odd people from Cayman go, go up there to the Sherm event. So, wow. you know, it's a pretty big portion of our uh, HR. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's incredible. Um, let's take a moment now to to reflect on uh, the 2016 Society Conference and Disrupt HR Cayman. Try to give me the top three components of what goes into creating an awesome event because I was there. These were amazing events. So if you could if you could list just three things that you need. To make it work, what would, what would they be? Okay, I always look at an event like a wedding, and if you think about what people talk about when they come away from a wedding, it is three things. I'm glad you asked what they are. Those three <laughs> things is the venue, the food, and the speeches. <laughs> and if you can get those three <laughs> things right, <laughs> you will have a successful event. Don't worry about all the fluff in between. Honestly, I, I used to spend so much time worrying about the bags and the giveaways and the sponsors and the vendors. They, they'll be there if people like this event. So first of all, your location. Obviously, I, I have a made-in-paradise location, but obviously the people who live here don't necessarily see that. Having it somewhere like the Ritz-Carlton um, does add uh, an element of class to it. We also get some amazing service from the Ritz. Um, and, and hence, you know, it, it runs smoothly when we're there. Speeches. Um, actually, I'll come on to those last, the food. You know, everyone gets hungry at conferences. Giving them biscuits and coffee isn't, isn't enough these days. You know, wow them a little bit. If you're using a great event, you can wow them a little bit with the food. And it puts people in a good mood if they get good food. And if they're in a good mood, they tend to listen and be more receptive and they tend to get engaged more. And at the end of the day, have a cocktail hour. People do stick around for it and do the networking and, and like to enjoy a drink. So it just. You know, I'd never like to be at a stuffy event. Um, so allow people to mix, network, keep it fun and lighthearted. You, just because you're in a fairly serious area of the market where you're discussing pretty serious topics doesn't mean you have to um, play it straight the whole day. So add an element of fun into it, use the food to do that. And then you have the speakers. And your speakers are your be-all and end-all as to how your actual event will go. So I very, very carefully pick my speakers. I want to be on, um, totally on plan with, with the audience that they're presenting to. I want to have some life. I want them to be energetic and, and really be passionate about what they're speaking about. So when you look at the speakers that we brought in this year, people like you know, Tim Sackett, William Tinkup, um, Chris Dunn, uh, Jennifer McClure, Carmen Hudson, you know, these are people that are really really passionate about what they do they, they're also um, they, they use humour and they use stories to, to get their message across keep people engaged and they, they, they can really sense an audience they know when an audience is drifting off they know when an audience <laughs> needs to be brought back in and they don't go on for too long I tend to keep my speakers you know, for having keynotes you know, 
35, 45 minutes with a bit of Q&A afterwards. Um, then allowed a, a long enough uh, bio break and a bit more food. Um, I ought to like and, and really do feel passionately about uh, you know, giving an opportunity to local talent uh, to present itself and, and see you know, how they measure up on a, on a global stage. Um, and if you bring in international speakers to a, to a conference, then you really get a measure of doing that. Um, so there, yeah, that's my three things, venue, uh, speakers, and food. Okay, you, you make it sound so simple. <laughs> I suspect it's not. <laughs> uh, what, what, what are the plans for 2017, Chris? Um, are, are you going to be looking to do any more disrupt events? Uh, are you involved in any other events as, as an organizer, as a speaker, as an attendee? What can you tell us at this stage? What, what, you, go, go ahead, please. Um, I'm definitely involved with the Disrupt Bermuda event. Um, not sure I'm allowed to tell you how or where or, or why at this stage, but I'm definitely, I will be there. Um, in what guise yet yeah, is to, to be confirmed, but I'll be at Disrupt Bermuda, uh, which is, which is going to be a pretty, pretty special event, the first one they've had in Bermuda. I think they've got quite a large East Coast contingent heading across there for a little bit of uh, warm weather. Um, I will be at Sturm this year as an attendee, uh, possibly we're, 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 yeah, definitely, definitely Sturm Major, and I'm, I'm possibly going to be at Sturm Talent. Um, we're talking about whether or not I'll present there, um, but I uh, would like to. Um, we will be having Disrupt Cayman again this year. We might not have it at the same time as conference, might spread it out a little bit to uh, give people the opportunity to come on two different dates to the Cayman Islands, so that'd be cool. Um, speaker lineup is to be announced. I'm happy to announce it on this show once we've got it nailed down. Um, and what else? Have I that takes up. And I'll be doing a bit of travelling. Um, I, I also, in addition to <laughs> the many other things that we we try and do, um, I work with Rotary in a, a company called the Guatemala uh, Literacy Project, which is um, an education project that helps keep kids in school in Guatemala. I travel a little bit around the state speaking at various Rotary clubs and that sort of thing to inform about the project and a very good um, uh, example of uh, a wellness project that PwC employ in, in process real time uh, allowed me to go off and do some charity work I mean they give me three or four weeks a year uh, I've got vacation, take vacation if I haven't I can take it as unpaid leave but it does allow me to just eat, you know, focus out, look at some uh, other things, stay a bit of the states, and uh, I come back to work with a renewed bigger. Uh, so I, I do one of the things that I am speaking about this year is uh, the wellness uh, projects and engagement initiatives that don't necessarily have to cost your company uh, fortunes. And that there's so many uh, good ones out there that uh, little things really do make big differences in in, in, in companies. So you, you you spoke a moment ago about. Um, bigger and you you're such a busy guy you, you, you get up to so many different things uh, you haven't even spoken about the fact that you're a triathlete as well um, well if, if, if you could if you could share in a couple of sentences maybe maybe a, a mantra that you have that something that you take in in your day-to-day -day life that, that, that you draw strength from that, that <laughs> help helps you be this guy you do make it sound like uh, something that other people don't do I mean I, I... I think you know, when I look at working mums, one of, one of the presentations I did was uh, how certain talent is overlooked, and there's a huge missed opportunity uh, out there at the moment with uh, vacancies going unfilled, and young recruiters and talent acquisition specialists overlooking uh, the mature workforce and the, you know, the returning parents. So I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but it's one of the things I'm quite passionate about. That there's some really key demographics in the workforce that need looking at and so when you say I do all these things you know I look at what a working mum or dad does in terms of uh, getting the kids up, getting to school, getting yep. to work getting to after school, picking them up you know and so I get to do things that I want to do so none of this is a chore for me, I, I really enjoy doing the conferences, I really enjoy disrupts I enjoy doing the charity work and the one thing that um, all of these things have in common is good food uh, every, every single one of these things <laughs> they have to feed you so in terms of trying to keep my waistline down um, I need a few goals throughout the year to um, to do so. So, that being said, I you know I did three uh, Ironman events 2016, and I've just signed up for the full Ironman Florida in November 2017, um, with a couple of marathons in between, just to uh, for good measure. So, you know, my 
my own personal mantra is if you think you're done, you're really only 40% done. And that comes from a Navy SEAL in the US who wrote a book called The 40% Rule. And it really is, you know, if, from an endurance point of view, when you actually think you can't do things anymore, you really are only 40% done because your brain will give up a thousand times before your body actually will. And I think that's, you know, <laughs> that, that's my endurance man- mantra. From a, from a day-to-day perspective, you just got to enjoy what it is you do. Um, and I don't mean that, you know, I know Mike Rowe says, um, you know, it, it was one of the worst pieces of advice he got was do something that makes you happy. But if what you do, you do well enough that it makes other people happy, that tends to make you happy as well. So I just try and do the things that I enjoy, build my career around that, because I know that then I can continue to be passionate. So that's kind of what it is. I do. Amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, so that, that takes us towards the end of this particular podcast episode. Just before we uh, wrap it up, how, how can our listeners learn more about you, Chris? Um, okay, there's a couple of... I'm on Twitter. Uh, I do tweet. Um, so you can find me at uh, Cayman HR Guy. I think it is Cayman HR Guy. I'm on Twitter. I have a blog called Anything Over Ice. Because really and truly, anything does go over ice, except bleach. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, I mean, if, if they feel free, feel free to reach out through Twitter, through LinkedIn, um, and that sort of thing. I'm always happy to take messages. So, listeners, that takes us to the end of this particular HR Chat podcast, brought to you by the HR Gazette. I've been your host, Bill Bannum, and until next time, thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the HR Chat Podcast, brought to you by the HR Gazette.